Thank you so much. I tell you though, thank goodness for Dorina. I tell you, if, 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 if we did not have to hold staff, not at the not, size. Not the way we did. Not this size, no. no. We'd be way skeptical. Yeah. And all the other clubs in the city don't have any staff. I don't know. If they have 22 members, I guess maybe I could see that. How do you have 80 members? Well, everybody's got to do stuff in that Yeah, exactly. In that case, of this no commission. Sloughing off. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They feel free. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to have it anyway. It's got to go from here. microphone. Am I on? Yes, I am. Thank God for that. Just to let you know, it's noon. Please go and get some food, get some uh, nice meal, and settle down for about 50 minutes. Enjoy your fellowship, and then we'll actually start the program.
Get your raffle tickets. Raffle tickets on sale. The pot's over a thousand dollars. Raffle ticket time.
The meeting proper is now starting. Thank you all for being here. And we're going to start, as always, with the pledge and song. And I'd like to invite Daryl Berkheimer. He's been with us since 2023 of Trico to come to the podium. Oh, there you go. You're coming up? Oh, yeah, why not? Hey, Come and join us. While we're waiting for him, I just want you all to know that eventually we're going to have waltzing Matilda, not necessarily my country, tis of thee. <laughs> What's today? <laughs> oh, right here. Okay, great. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I guess here we go on the song. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Play ball. Good to see you again. Nice to see you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. That's really very good. And um, Chris, you will make sure you know how to play waltzing Holder for the future. Okay, you got it. Fine. Good. Um, before we actually go for the inspiration, I want you all to know that we've got to send get well wishes to Alan Shrope. Alan came back to us not long ago, and he's been diagnosed with sick sinus syndrome, which I know my niece has, and so I'm, I'm aware of um, the severity of it. It's a heart rhythm disorder, and he's had a pacemaker <laughs> inserted. Again, we've been there, done that. Alan, I'm with you. Um, we are wishing him well and a speedy recovery. Cards are being passed around. That's for Alan Shrope. He's, if you know, he has the Bow Wow um, agency that looks after animals, dogs. Alan. So now we have Chris Edwards. Chris, he's going to give us the inspiration and a happy Jackson. And because he's taking up a lot of our time, he's given me a hundred dollar note. Just, yeah, right. I know not many of us see them that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, I haven't done one of these inspirations before, but I got inspired by this. It's a little long, and I'm going to try and go quickly. I'm going to go. Halfway through. There are many, many components to leadership. Even defining leadership can be difficult. Margaret, you can kick me in the butt afterwards. If you look up at the term leadership in a dictionary, you almost always find a definition that uses the terms lead or leading within it. So then how could you define leadership without using its root word? The best definition I can think of comes from the late General Colin Powell, former Secretary of State, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm paraphrasing the general, but he defined leadership as having the ability to inspire people to follow you if for no other reason than out of mere curiosity. Now, this speech was by the Tucson Fire Department. She's rushing me. By Charles M. Ryan, he, uh, he actually wrote this, so that's where that comes from. Leaders create conditions of trust within an organization. Leaders get followers to believe the mission and the path forward. Trust like respect is earned and not merely given. You must, as a leader, continually work to engender the trust of those you seek to lead. In the absence of their trust, you will not succeed. I'll talk about that trust factor in a little bit. This reminds me of all of you in this room, by the way. Also, leaders do far more than manage people. And I know this. Management and leadership are two very different things. Managing is tactical. Leading is strategic. Managing is the present. Leadership looks to the future. It's imperative to remain mindful of leading without managing. It's not easy. We are most comfortable. I'm going to finish this, and I'll, I'll do the rest later for you later. We are almost all uh, almost comfortable where we are in what we know and in what we do well. Leadership is about being uncomfortable. 
not always knowing what's ahead, but knowing where you want to be. And sometimes leadership takes you to places where you may not have previously excelled. To lead effectively, you must free yourself of the manager's mindset. See the forest through the trees, if you will. See over the trees. And I've got about four more minutes, but I'm not going to do it. I thought he had a happy Jackson as well, but apparently that was it. So that's fine. He's given us $100 so he could speak at the podium. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> Terrific, Chris. Thank you very, very much. And you all know Chris. He's, he's the owner of Appliances, Tucson Appliance Company. I go there regularly. And now, Dan. Dan, 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 Dan. Introduction of guests. Yes, and make sure that all guests, you stand up and stay standing. So, oh, yeah, I know, I know, I, yeah, it is, go for it. <coughs> welcome, welcome everyone. I have to, uh, before I introduce the guests, uh, I don't know if you all remember, Fletcher McCusker gave a, a, a talk of, a few months ago about what's going on in Tucson, and he said that Tucson was one of the top musical cities in, this, in the country. And I have to tell you last night that uh, the, remember the rock group Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen, the 80s, all that? His kid last night started his big national tour in Tucson. It was amazing. So in case you're curious, Tucson's music scene is crazy. All right. So for guests, if you would please, we'd like to acknowledge you. If you'd please stand. So from the Catalina Club, we got Barbara Kiernan. Barbara? From the Kino Club, we have Dennis Berquist. Hey, Dennis. And from an unnamed club in California, we have Buzz Dempsey, under the radar. Hi, Buzz. <laughs> All right. Get your, guest of Mitch Pisick, uh, Peter Paisley. Peter? Get your, guest of Mitch Pisick, Clark Goading. Uh, guest of Margaret Higgins, Carol Hansen. Carol? Guest of Brittany Battle, Ricardo Bolivar. Guest of Brittany Battle, Amanda Giro. Amanda. Guest of Diane Cannon, Sandy McCall McCaslin. Uh, guest of Bruce Ayers, Jeff Lamey. Guest of Steve Pickering, Mary K. Bogey. John Wong, Noreen Wong. And that would be all the guests. I will tell you that we are so happy that you're here. There are a ton of Rotarians. If you like what you see and you're excited about serving in the community and making a difference, talk to one of us. We'd love to have you become a member. Thanks. Thanks, Dan, for that. That was great. And thank you. It's wonderful to see so many guests. It really is. And we do hope that uh, you enjoy yourselves here and consider joining us. Right. So now it's the program, the moment we've all been waiting for. And I know that some people have come here specifically to hear this talk. So, Diana, perhaps you'd like to do the introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Dr. Steeter and Nets and Netzine Stecklis are experts in the field of primatology. That's the branch of zoology that deals with primates. They met 37 years ago at a primatology conference in Austin, Texas, and fell in love at first sight. Both have a litany of degrees, honors, and awards. And by the way, John Wong, Netzine got her master's from Princeton. <laughs> And um, Dieter was a professor of primatology at my undergrad alma mater, Rutgers. When Diane Fossey was murdered in her bed by poachers, her international organization called upon Dieter and Netzine to step in and carry on her work in Africa. They arrived in Rwanda two years after Diane had died to find that the crime scene had been left untouched for two years and their first order of business was to clean out her cabin, including the bloody sheets still on her bed. They continued Diane Fossey's work with the mountain gorillas for the next 13 years, at which point they were forced to flee for their own lives 
from Rebels. We are most fortunate that this amazing couple now resides in Tucson, and they head up the School of Animal and Comparative Biomedical Science at the University of Arizona. Today, we're going to hear the untold, behind-the-scenes human stories that you can't read about in the published research. Please help me welcome Dr. Dieter Steckless and Dr. Netzine Steckless. Oh yeah, keep that away from Dieter, okay? <laughs> All right, we'll share our little microphone here. <laughs> How's that? Can everyone hear us? Okay. And we've got the clicker, and there we go. You can see from both sides. Excellent. Well, as you might have guessed, I'm Netzine, and... Tough guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Dieter, obviously. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting us. Thanks, Diana, for yeah. a wonderful introduction. Thanks for a great lunch. <laughs> I will be staring at that piece of cake throughout my I talk. Know. I seriously keep that away uh, from so him. So <laughs> that's really dangerous. But <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, you can have that one, darling. Hey, yeah. my own mic. I love it. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you can take That'll it off. Be easier. That would be easier. Okay, cool. And since I have the clicker, may I stand on this side? Because then I can yeah. have free access. All okay, right. here we go. Here we go. So yeah, we are going to talk a little bit about. Um, the untold stories, as uh, we call them, because as Diana correctly said, these are often not things that get into the published literature, but we think that they're equally important. They're equally important, as we'll say a little bit more about, in terms of revealing the nature of what kind of an animal the gorilla is. And what it takes to conserve this species. Yes. So let's get going. I think you already, we were already introduced, so there um, is just us. Just to, to let you know that, you know, we in the car we were thinking, how long have we been working in Africa? And I think we debated it for 10 minutes, but I, it's true. We've been working there for 35 years, right? Um, 15 of that was devoted just to mountain gorillas, but we've also done chimpanzees and other primates and other animals as well. So. That's right. Chased hippopotamuses through the forest. No, no, and they done, chased oh, us. Oh, oh, what, is okay. that how it works? That's okay. how it works. No, no, they chased <laughs> I us. I forgot. <laughs> True enough. Uh, and that includes, you know, research, conservation, even taking students. Uh, we started a field school there and took students there. And, of course, we uh, also have led tours and actually have one coming up. We'll tell you more about that. But the story Sorry. begins with Diane Fossey, the late Diane Fossey. Uh, and, the, you know, it begins with her rightly, even though there were people, there were researchers that had studied mountain gorillas before Diane Fossey. The fact is that her approach to the study of mountain gorillas, which you'll hear just a few more words about in a minute, was so different that it really uh, led subsequently to... Uh, public affection for the mountain gorilla, for gorillas at large, yeah. you might say, and made the conservation of this magnificent animal a huge success story. So it's only right to begin with yeah. her. And I think it also lets us know where we're talking here, where Rwanda is where she began this research. That's that little dot, that red dot in the middle of Africa right there. You can see it kind of central east Africa. And the Virunga volcanoes, which you can see behind Diane Fossey there, um, is this small patch of forest uh, in green that straddles three countries, Rwanda, Uganda, and Democratic Republic of Congo. These are countries you might have heard of in the news and probably because of terrible things that happen there. But there's also wonderful things that happen there too. Right, uh, it's not an easy place to work for a lot of reasons, but this is one reason because the habitat of the gorillas and the Virungas there is divided among three countries. Mm -hmm. The gorillas don't need passports. They'd yeah. cross the yep. <laughs> borders quite freely, but it's not so easy for the researchers. No. Yeah, but that's a separate story. <laughs> so uh, Diane began her work by uh, building, um, after, a few, after a year or so, uh, a research camp, basically, named the Karaselke Research 
center. Uh, it's up at 10,000 feet, and it's really a very simple kind of center. Uh, initially, there was only her cabin, which you can see uh, the wood frame structure there. And uh, it's it's because it's at 10,000 feet, you've got to truck everything up. Porters, and well, I don't mean truck everything. I mean Carry. On your back, <laughs> carry it, exactly. No vehicles can get up there. Uh, but you have porters. You hire porters. You have to have your whole staff with you, basically, in camp because you're isolated on top of this mountain. Now, she started out with the focus on mountain gorillas and researching them, trying to find out something about their lives. But that quickly expanded into conservation, as you'll see. With her research, however, what was unique, and as what Dieter said a moment ago, is really true. At the time when you did research on an animal, you really did research on kind of a group or a population. You didn't pay attention to the individual. And she was interested in the individual lives of these animals. And so she started by first identifying each one of them individually. How do you tell one fuzzy black gorilla from another? Right? Well, she figured out a way. She noticed that their little noses have nose prints. So this is Turatsinzi, and she's a beautiful female, and you, below it is the nose print that we use to identify her. Uh, and if you keep an eye on that nose, uh, no matter how old she gets, you will see that same nose. It's like a, it's like a fingerprint. Yeah. Uh, so Diane Fossey identified individuals, started recognizing that they had unique relationships, unique personalities, and unique roles in that group. She would come home and type her field notes every night, type them in triplicate. Do you remember when you used to put carbon between sheets, right? And you, tri and you have to really press hard to get <laughs> triplicate. So that's impressive to me, especially using that pinky, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I love that she did that. She did it in triplicate because she sent one back to the States, one copy to the States so that it would not be lost. And thank goodness she did because with all the troubles that were to come, things got totally destroyed at Karasoki. But all her notes were saved. And in fact, that was my job for 15 years is to scour through all her notes. I got to know Diane Fossey really, really well. What a pistol she was, let me say. <laughs> so here she is and recognizing now uh, individuals, but also forming really um, intense relationships with some of them, uh, especially with her favorite gorilla here, uh, Digit. Big silverback male. So, uh, you know, before Diane Fossey, and this includes Diane Fossey, the thinking was these are fearsome apes. They're obviously the largest of the primates. I mean, a male gorilla, a silverback, as you see there, chest beating, which is a form of threat display, uh, can weigh five or 600 pounds, solid muscle. And uh, when they rush at you, and this has of course happened to us a few times when you first are introduced to gorillas, they don't know you yet, you get rushed quite a bit. They don't make contact with you, but that, it doesn't take contact. You'll run, you'll turn and run, <laughs> uh, chances are. So Diane was very reluctant to go look, near them. Look for your extra underwear too. Well, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to mention that, but yes. <laughs> Uh, anyway, but you know, it's a re it's a significant uh, issue because if you want to get them, if you want to get to know them as individuals, hang out with them, you know, study their family life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, their daily routines, it's very difficult to do that from a distance, and so she had to find a way to get close to them. Uh, eventually she overcame her fear and she was in fact able to turn this whole idea, this whole notion, this whole image of the gorilla as this fearsome ape into quite the opposite, which is that they're in fact what she called gentle giants. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're amazing because we've worked with chimps. Chimps are not gentlemen uh, by any stretch of the imagination, they're not gentle giants. They're also very large and very powerful, but they're very aggressive and very volatilely aggressive. Gorillas, despite their enormous strength and size, are really quite calm most of the time, unless you threaten them. Don't threaten them. They will tear you apart, but yeah. it's only if you do that. So it did transform this image from a King Kong scary monster to a lovable creature, and when something becomes lovable, then people are willing to pay attention yeah. and to try to preserve it. That was all because of her getting close and 
telling the stories of these individual animals and, and the relationships that they have amongst each other when they huddle in the sun like you see here or with her when they're curious about her. Well, her work, which was at the time necessarily focused on protection, on anti-poaching in particular, because there was so much poaching of other wildlife in the forest at that time. People were bringing the cows in. They were grazing in the forest, eating up basically the food that the gorillas also eat. But uh, the most dangerous part is, was, is the poaching, which is that uh, they would set snare traps for other animals Antelope, in particular, the gorillas would get their hands caught in the or their feet caught in the in those snares. They couldn't remove them. The limbs would become gangrenous, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, she had to focus uh, on on anti poaching, on building, in fact, an anti poaching patrol. She recruited men. Uh, at that time, they were all men, and um, they would go out every day and uh, find the gorillas and look for snares in particular. And you can see that uh, those are some horrific pictures there that uh, some animals uh, were killed on, on purpose because they were killed uh, by poachers to harvest their heads and hands and sell on the black market. Uh, others, as you see in the top picture there, succumbed to the sort of snare wounds uh, that they had. So they would recover mountains of snares and would burn them, as you can see in that picture there. Now, I, let me go back to this previous slide, which shows the population estimated back in the 60s, around 450. And look at this drop. It was, it was really deteriorating. That red circle is really around Diane Fossey's time. She was seeing the persistent deterioration of the population. And she was convinced and wrote that she was convinced this, this species is going to be extinct in her lifetime. So what happened? She was this devoted, not only just researcher, but devoted to mm -hmm. the conservation work. And so she became what she said, she called it active conservation. She went out there and stopped poachers. That did not make them very happy, I will say. Right, and unfortunately she was murdered, probably connected with her uh, unusual anti-poaching tactics, you might say. She would scare the poachers, scare the uh, children of the poachers. She was really quite desperate because there were only a couple hundred gorillas left in the world at that time. She had to do something, very desperate mm -hmm. times. So she was murdered in her cabin, as Diana said in the introduction. Uh, she is, as this picture shows, uh, buried alongside the, her, some of her favorite gorillas. This is the gorilla graveyard at the uh, Karasoki camp, um, and you can see her plaque right next to, her grave is right next to her beloved um, gorillas. So let's fast forward to the present. The Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund was formed from the foundations of what Diane Fossey started. She started it and she called it the Digit Fund after that favorite gorilla, and then it was transformed into the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. And you might have heard of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund in the news because there was a big event a few years ago when Ellen DeGeneres was given a birthday gift that was establishing a new research center for the preservation of gorillas. That was her lovely birthday gift from Portia. Yeah, who knew that Ellen DeGeneres loved I gorillas? I didn't know that, <laughs> but I really like that idea as a birthday mm. gift. So... Just saying. You want a research center? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, I would love a research center. So it is newly opened uh, and represents a lot of what the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund does today. They do continue the research that Diane Fossey established. We started with her records. That's 55 years. It's the, one of the longest consecutive research stations in the world. And now it's even bigger and it's expanded and you have people visiting all the gorillas every day to make sure that they're safe and taking notes on their behavior and their births and their deaths and things like that. We've expanded to include lots of kinds of research, not just gorillas, but on the habitat and on the other animals in that amazing, beautiful alpine, uh, Afro-Alpine forest. Her conservation also continues. Uh, but it continues also expanded. Absolutely, anti-poaching patrol is at the core. There still are poachers that are trying to make a living by uh, hunting animals in the forest. 
So the anti-poaching patrol is very powerful, but there's added dimensions that really make it successful. Huge conservation education program. There are thousands of children that live directly uh, next to the park. That's a great place to begin because those children will grow up and will be tempted to go into the park to do poaching. So a huge conservation education program. And also ecotourism. This is a unique ecotourism country because they decided early on that there's only a few hundred mountain gorillas. If we do what they do in Kenya, which is a massive amount of tourists that come through, everyone can go on safari and you have 15 cars lined up to see the lion in the middle, that's not sustainable for this country. You have a few animals. They came up with regulations that were in the best interest of the animals. And that means for one hour a day, you get a group of maybe eight people visiting a gorilla group, all right? That's it, one hour a day, eight people. The rest of their life is left, you know, to their wild, uh, to their wild imaginations. Well, I mean, it's shocking when you think about it, you know, not, not the fact that you only get an hour, you know, mm -hmm. but the fact that gorillas allow you to follow them around. Oh, that's true day in and day out for 50 years, right? <laughs> Imagine you having somebody follow you around daily from morning till night for 50 years. Yeah, that's true. Would you be tolerant? <laughs> I am just amazed at their tolerance. Well, and their tolerance, to be fair, they're only tolerant. If you walked into this gorilla group, they would attack you. But if you walk in with us, they know us. They look at us and they go, oh, I know you. Oh, you brought some guests. Maybe well, your hair has changed yeah, a little yeah. bit, but oh, yeah, we know they know. You. Yeah. They'll know if I have a different hair clip. They will exactly. come investigate. That's right. So yeah. they're very attentive. So anyway, part of the conservation program is to admit tourism. Those tourist dollars, that really supports conservation. It does go back to conservation uh, initiatives. Well, you can see from the numbers here, uh, well, we can see several things. One is that mountain gorillas are just one of two species of gorilla. There are several subspecies within each of those two species, a little bit of scientific uh, jargon there if you like. Uh, but you can see if you look at the uh, numbers that uh, there aren't very many mountain gorillas. They're just a little bit over a thousand, thousand sixty-three uh, based on, <coughs> on the last uh, census. Um, and, um, but Dieter, you know what? That's that's almost ten times what it was well, when that's Diane right. Fossey predicted they would go extinct. Took right? the words right out of my well, mouth. That's I mean, exactly I, right. It's amazing. Exactly that, right. That it's it really is a conservation success story. When most, as a primatologist, we both know the dire conditions of most primates in the world. Most of the populations are declining. This is a tremendous success story. Yeah, and they're the best protected of all the different kinds of gorillas. Mo all the gorillas that you see in zoos today are the western lowland gorillas, and that they come from that yellow portion there, the marked in yellow on the, the, or, the, the western yellow, part yeah. of uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been very successful. <clears throat> so. Um, when you do research for 50 some years, and you know, there are very few animals for uh, whom there is research of that length where you're looking at un uninterrupted kind of research. There's an enormous amount you can do in terms of the continuous monitoring of the population. Most of that, almost exclusively, has been done on the, if you look at the right part of that slide, you can see a lighter green area. That's known as the Karasoki sector. So it's this region around the Karasoki Research Center where there's fairly high group density, many of the gorillas are there, uh, uh, many of the anti-poaching uh, patrols are, are there, and so that's where the researchers have focused for 50 some years to study those groups. Census is, whenever a census is conducted, it's conducted throughout that entire Virunga range, of course, so you get a total uh, number of uh, gorillas. But uh, what, what's, what's uh, interesting here, I wanna uh, just draw a little bit of attention to, is that when you then crunch the data uh, to see how well the population is doing, you often get some surprising results, right? Because you'd expect that with all that protection, great habitat, et cetera, that the population would just continue to grow. Because it hasn't, we know this, it hasn't reached carrying capacity. What that means is that there's enough, still enough habitat 
uh, and particularly enough food for the gorillas in that region. So they've not approached a point where they cannot grow as a population. But if you look at this growth rate chart, you'll see that it's, it's over the 50 years, right, of data that be, all of those conservation efforts have really uh, paid off because the growth rate was beginning to climb and climb and climb, and then it flattened out. Uh, and guess what? And this is the surprising part. It began to decline. What the heck is going on? Why is it declining? Well, what's interesting is that when you dig into the data, what you find out is that uh, uh, the, you had very, the, the groups began to swell right around the time that you see the peak in that growth rate. The groups got bigger and bigger, yet these super groups. Well, uh, just as an example, you know, when we started there, group size was about 10 animals. When, towards the end of 15 years, group size, so we had some groups, okay, 10 animals, one silverback, maybe two, and the females, you know, think of that kind of like a group is one table. That's about the group size. When we left there, we were seeing groups of 60, mm -hmm. 60 animals, 60 gorillas together. Multiple four, silverbacks. Four silverbacks. Yeah. This is unheard of. And so then things started to shift. <clears throat> That's exactly right. So what happens when the groups are that large? They're not sustainable at that size. Gorillas are pretty selfish. Every silver, silverback wants his own cadre of females. Uh, sorry, every female wants her own silverback. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm, fair enough. That, that's the other side. The, uh, we are the kingmakers. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a fair point. I, none of what I'm saying contradicts that. I'm absolutely right. It cuts both ways. But the point is that the groups eventually fissioned. So those big groups began to break up into smaller groups back to a sort of single silver back leading a group of females. The females selecting who would be leading the race. Yes, yeah. oh, okay. uh, and, and so what happened was the density of groups actually increased in this entire area. So right? that's a really now, important little little nuance there is that you had numbers going up, but that means groups were getting big and then they would break up into many, many little groups. So instead of in our core area, we would have maybe four gorilla groups. Now there was 10 groups in that area. What does that mean then for the population? Well, this is this is why does the growth rate go down? Because that's what the previous uh, uh, graph showed, you know. Well, uh, first of all, this is a, a satellite photo. Uh, you can see there that uh, on the top portion is the Virunga Range. That is the total range of the gorillas, mountain gorillas. It's surrounded by everything that's uh, colored in purple. That's an artificial coloring, obviously. That's agricultural fields. The gorillas are landlocked. They basically, on an island, they can't go anywhere. They're surrounded by human populations. So density increases. Eventually, they will reach carrying capacity. They're not there yet. But here's the point. When you dig into the data, what you find is that when groups uh, split up like that, so you have many, many groups, but they can't go very far because the area is limited, right? So you have many, many more group encounters, mm. encounters between groups. Those are opportunities for those greedy males to try to attract females from the group that they're encountering, right? And, and they an will do everything. It's an opportunity for the females to assess. Do I like the silverback I have now okay. or that other silverback? And then they think, hmm, I think he's hotter, and they'll transfer over. All That's right, why so we're both giving a presentation, exactly, because <laughs> that is a fair and balanced view of it. <laughs> you don't have to watch Fox Network to get a fair and balanced view. Right exactly. here, right here. Exactly. So, so, yeah, that's right. So, but what happens is, when all so females are transferring more as they're hey yeah it's a good looking silverback mm -hmm. I'll try that one, uh, they'll tra transfer multiple times. What the statistics show is that when you transfer a lot, you de it delays reproduction in those females by a year or two every time they transfer. So the more you transfer the less often you reproduce, right. basically. So that's why you get this wonderful number of uh, individuals growing, but then you get this dip of reproductive rate because there's so many female transfers. Isn't that interesting? We could only know this. If someone did a, this graph, they would, have, they would have maybe predicted that this is, a, this is a population that's doing very badly. But it's only because we know these details, we understand why the growth rate looks this way and understand that it's about female transfer. Now, can we do anything about that? 
Probably not, uh, but uh, they, it, well, the one thing we can nature do, has its way they of have, doing what it wants. You don't know exactly. You think you're doing a great job with conservation, and you don't know what all the consequences are. So it makes us humble. You know, you have to have a little humility when you do conservation. You can't control everything. There are often unexpected kinds That's of right. effects, exactly. Yeah. So the population is doing well, but that was a uh, surprising uh, um, result. We got to keep going. We okay. got to keep so. so Yes, we need time for questions. So yes. we wanted to give you a couple of those untold stories. So that's the story of conservation. But what about what's happening you know, that you don't see in the news, that you don't see in those papers? So we wanted to share a few of those, at least about the gorillas and some other things. Well, I love this quote from Diane Fossey. Gorillas are not inferior beings, but friends with feeling, imagination, awareness. That's the kind of insight sense insight mm -hmm. about what a gorilla is as an animal that doesn't often come through at all in the published literature because science sort of forces you to be so objective and numerical in, in your accounts of things that you're, you're not going to say very much about imagination or feeling or well, we, about could, we would never be able to put things, that in a right? paper but, but you read know. this and we know it that it's true because exactly. of these untold stories so here's a story encounters uh, who do we have here? We have Maggie. Maggie. Oh, she's a spitfire. She's a female that I got to know um, that was uh, very curious, a very curious animal. I know that she was one of uh, Sigourney Weaver's favorite gorillas. Do you know Sigourney Weaver from the movie Gorillas in the Mist? She actually spent some time up there mm -hmm. with the gorillas while making the movie. And, uh, of course, Maggie was very curious about this movie star, and so they formed a bond, and that is her favorite gorilla. But my story has to do with some an encounter I had with Maggie that was very unexpected. We leave the group when it's time for us to have lunch. We move away from the group, as you guys are doing here. We move far away so that we can eat our lunch and not um, have the gorillas be interested in human food. So that's a common practice in research facilities. So we were far away from the group, and we was eating my, I don't know, peanut butter sandwich or whatever the usual. And um, we're sitting here next to each other, and all of a sudden, this big, black, hairy hand comes between us. And it wasn't me. And it wasn't, no. <laughs> and was grabbing at my sandwich. And my instinct, I saw it, I knew it was a gorilla. My instinct was a, a gorilla instinct, which what another female would do, which is I slapped it and I went, oh, 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 oh. That's a threat a, call. Which is a threat. Don't touch my lunch, okay? And at that instant, I said, oh my God, what I just do? I just threatened the gorilla. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna, she's gonna kill me. She's gonna kill me. And then I turn around and she looks at me and she slaps my hand and goes, oh, oh, oh. And then she tried to reach for it, and I pushed her again. I said, oh, oh, and she pushed me a little, oh, oh, oh. and we went back and forth in this very measured response. It's kind of a tit for tat, really. And yeah. I was just blown away. Do you know the insights about their cognition from that interaction? You can't get from all the papers we've written, right, and all the time we've been there. Well, there, it's a very measured. We studied chimps, too. If I did that to a chimp, my hand would be like this, right? I'd be missing all those fingers right now, right? For sure. Uh, they don't have that kind of same uh, emotional regulation. And so what is it about gorillas that give them that emotional regulation that's required perhaps to live in that kind of social environment? But we got that from that interaction with Maggie. I know it was accidental. I'm not suggesting that we make those kinds of encounters happen because normally no. we try to keep our distance from the gorillas, mm -hmm. you know, at least 10 feet or so. But sometimes that happens. Somebody will, like Maggie, sneak up on you and there's not a heck of a lot you can do. <laughs> do the best you can. But it, it's a great learning moment, exactly right. So here's another story um, about uh, Pablo, <laughs> who was an up-and-coming silverback. He wanted to be a silverback leader of his own group so badly. That's what every up-and-coming silverback wants. But, you right? know, he was uh, a youngster he was one of the babies during Diane Fossey's time and Diane Fossey in her day she was friends with all these gorillas including cuddling with them and tickling them and really just being part of the group so here's several pictures these are all Pablo this is all Pablo when he was little Pablo okay there's Diane Fossey tickling him uh, David Watts is getting a big nice he's a great primatologist getting a big hug from Pablo uh, you might recognize the gentleman in the far right corner 
David Attenborough when he was doing a, yep, yep. He's still he's a young man there. Then, yeah. uh, Yes, a very young <laughs> David Attenborough. Um, and then uh, another one of Pablo climbing all over a young lady named Kelly Stewart, daughter of Jimmy Stewart. She was a researcher with Diane Fossey whoa, 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 for many whoa, whoa, years. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was bad. Okay, so that's little Pablo. What we didn't know is that, well, Pablo grows up, and he looks like this. <laughs> This is Big Pablo. <laughs> well, so Big Pablo, uh, because he was so used to being with people, to playing with people, etc., he would take his liberties there. He is, in fact, just sort of sitting on top of Kelly Stewart uh, as he's a larger male. But one of the things he did to me is, I w while I was carefully taking notes, he would sneak up behind me, and I would usually wear a backpack, grab my backpack, and rush through the jungle with me, dragging me behind... <laughs> You know, at high speed for about 20 yards or so. So it was a hell of a jungle ride, you know, one I hadn't counted on. He did this several times. Eventually it was funny, you know, because I realized I wasn't going to get hurt. He was using me basically as a display object to show off to the other gorillas how big and tough he was. He could do this with me, right. no problem. And he never hurt movie. you, Never hurt but it was me. a fantastic display. And what happened to Pablo? He became the leader of one of the largest gorilla groups ever. So thank you, Dieter, for yeah, assisting him. I did him my part. <laughs> I, I did my part. Exactly right. Let's go. Let's scoot to the last slide because I know we're running out of time. Um, this is just to say that there's so many stories we missed. We would love to tell you all about them. Uh, and maybe you can just kind of um, encounter them yourself and create your own stories because we do, uh, we are leading a tour this summer uh, to take Next people summer. to gorillas. This coming summer, like yeah. 24, yeah. Um, and again, it's a unique experience because you can't, you know, there's very few actually spots to be able to go see them. I just want to read this quote from one of your members, from Nancy Bevins. Thanks for sharing this. She said, you know, my son went to see gorillas one time. I said, really? And she, so she sent me this wonderful picture of him with gorillas. I'm like, God, that's so fantastic. That's Matt, Matt Bevins. And that's yeah. Matt, your yeah. son. And he wrote this after seeing them. This is his quote. Seeing the mountain gorillas in Rwanda was a truly life-changing experience and perhaps my most cherished travel memory. Seeing the gorillas' familial bonds and their incredibly human-like way ways of interacting with each other, you realize the animal world is not so different from our own. And that, in turn, makes you realize the immensity of what could be lost if we don't protect these beautiful creatures and their last remaining pockets of habitat. I love that quote, but wait, there's more. Because when she sent me the quote, she said, you know, but, but he forgot to mention something. So this is the rest from Nancy. Why didn't you say that after the gorilla trek, and you also went to Sumatra, you quit your job as the deputy chief of staff at the US Export-Import Bank, went back to school for an MBA, and now work as VP for the Purpose Venture Group, which focuses on making businesses more environmentally sustainable. So it was That's a life changer impact. for yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It often is. Uh, Eight people, we will go up to 12 maximum, but we keep it very small because it's a small group with us, in, with the gorillas. Yes, quest so questions now? What do you think? Briefly. Briefly. We have a question there. What's the gestation time? It's almost exactly like humans. Yeah, eight and a half months. And then they're, they're Yeah, great questions. That's my whole research area, so thanks, I planted you. Uh, yes, infants are dependent on mom. They suckle with mom for three and a half years, and then they are weaned, and then they uh, start maturing around 10 years old. Silverbacks, they don't get that silver, that silver on that silver saddle until they're like 12, and then they, they're nice and big and strong, so yeah. Yes? So, so who got the sandwich, you or Maggie? Ha <laughs> ha, I did. Excellent question, yes, I yes. did actually. <laughs> <laughs> I got the sandwich. <laughs> Why don't you select, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we've got two more questions. Yeah, John, Dr. John, Is hold on. Is there any way to know whether the ecotourism that human interaction is affecting individual gorilla behavior and intergroup gorilla behavior? Oh, wow. Do, Really good second question and the first question. So that was definitely a question we had, so we did research on that. And we tried to see whether their behavior changed while there was visitors there, or even trackers were there. Um, it was a little tricky to do, but we ended up 
discovering that when trackers are present with the gorillas or researchers or researchers they take a nap it's well, like they're they're you know because yeah. they're very vigilant they're the cell the silverbacks everybody's careful about that environment and making sure everybody's safe but because we're there and they trust us either as a researcher or as a tracker uh they're like oh he's got the watch i'm gonna go take a nap <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, so they're not moving as much and not feeding quite as much, uh, but there's no difference between groups for, to which at one point tourism, uh, tourists did not go through, go to, and those which are visited in reproductive rate. Yeah, same okay? reproductive rate. Yeah. But your question about intergroup encounters, I don't think we have any data on that. That's a good question. Uh, who Were you involved this? with any of the sign language um, research? That we was done? worked with Coco. Well, we don't know sign language, but we worked with uh, Coco. We we visited Coco a few times and worked with uh, Penny Patterson. You know, who uh, took care of Coco was her teacher in some ways, because we we were interested in the emotional life of an animal. We saw the the fact that Coco had command of some. Uh, linguistic, you know, uh, signaling, as it were, uh, that was an opportunity for us to see if she could be goaded to say something about what she was thinking. Wait. Not just, I want something, right. I would like something, but what is my internal state like? You know, what am I feeling? Mm -hmm. You know, can, can we teach her emotion words and things That's of right. that sort? Last question. Last question. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I Hello. Oh. <laughs> I would like to know, did the um, gorillas have any kind of reaction to Diane Fossey's death? Were they mm -hmm. there? Did they try to defend her? Oh, interesting. So she was, uh, she was killed in her cabin. So she wasn't out with the gorillas at that time. We, there has been a study about what happens when one of their fellow gorillas is killed. And, um, and it is very controversial in the evidence is mixed. Some people say they behave differently, and some people say they just treat it as, as if something's weird, right? Like, it's not moving anymore. Make it move, you know? Um, so it's still, the evidence on whether they recognize death is still controversial. But yeah, they were not with her when she was killed. <laughs> Thank you. I know you all want much more, but you know what? No chance. And Netsin, I just want to let you know my nickname is Maggie. Oh, no, it could be Digit, isn't it? You get to slap my hand. Maggie, yeah. <laughs> I did think I could kind of slip my hand behind you to let you know that you're running out of time and then go, ooh, ooh, ooh. And then you'd go, ooh, ooh, ooh. And then we'd have a real fun time. But anyway. Okay. Um, I just want you to know that as a, a function of the talk, and thank you very, very much for the talk, we always give a book, we donate a book to Make Way for Books Library. And this one is entitled Good Night Gorilla. So I will ask you both to sign it. And just to let you know that David Lovett here, he is the president of our Make Way for Books here in Tucson. So please sign and that will... The, the children will love it, I know, absolutely. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, <laughs> it's hard to know where to go from this. It was such a wonderful talk, thank you. However, it's now happy birthday time, and our first person to be happy birthdayed is Hugh Thompson. And I have some words about you that I have to give you all as well. In honor of our recent time in Australia, I have to let you know that Hugh, he was an alternate on the 1956 US Olympic rowing team to Melbourne, Australia, where the Yale 8, the Yale 8 oared boat won the gold medal. Not only that, he's climbed three 14,000 plus foot peaks, Mount Rainier, the Grand Teton, and the 18,500 foot Kalapata, 1,000 feet above the base camp of Mount Everest. I hope I pronounced those all correctly. <laughs> Here you go.
Thank you. Good afternoon. My advice to newcomers is get involved. Just coming to the lunch is fun, but it won't open your rotary heart. Double eights is a pretty big number, but walking into the energy of this club makes me a little light on my feet. Thank you. I want to thank the late Dr. Richard Kincaid and the present Dr. John Wong for inviting me into this club. As I look back on my life, accepting their invitation to join the International Rotary family was a life-changing event for me. Rotarians are fascinating people of self-actualized who want to give themselves to others. Service above self, knowing that service is a gift of love. As we live our unique lives every day with a rotary four-way test foremost, we are always, always presented with an opportunity to share service in our own unique way. I say share in the same way that Harold Klimp mentions it in this quote. As we give of ourselves, of our patience and love, to someone else who needs it more, something changes inside us. Something flows in, a flow of good feeling, a spiritual upliftment occurs both in us and the person receiving the love. Harold Clamp further says, quote, God's love is everywhere, in a child's hug, in a puppy's eagerness to play, and in the blooming of wildflowers in the lawn. The more we can accept divine love, the more we can receive. Yet accepting God's love is only half of it. The other part is giving it back through service. Why? Because love is all that matters. Thank you. His birthday was on August the 13th, and he was Rotary Club of President, 1997-1998, and that's why he was allowed to give that really lengthy talk, because he got the President's <laughs> Minute. All right, fine. And he lived this long because he allows people to do things like this. I'm going to raffle off his dessert, if anybody's willing to. Whoa, do we have $10? I mean, it feeds four. E oh, sorry, 25 he said. $25. Who will give 25 Yeah, we've got one. Fabulous. Oh, oh, hang on. You're going to pay $25 so they can have a dessert? Oh. Fabulous. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> hang on. I do believe in pushing the envelope. Would anybody like to pay $30 so they can have a dessert? And put a banana. No. <laughs> That's why he's as healthy as he is, because he allows us to do these things. Um, the next one is Phil Good, who was president 2015-2016. He's been with us since 1989. And Phil, I mean, Phil, you meant to tell us something about yourself. And what did he say? My wife, Nancy, was the first ever family member of the Rotary Club of Tucson, and she's remained a member ever since joining. <laughs> what about you, Phil? Thank you. Good day, mates. Quite right. <laughs> what Hugh said. I don't know that I could say anything any better. Um, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> he took some of my time. I have a half-eaten dessert, though, for $10, if anybody would like that. <laughs> you know, I look around the room from up here. This perch is kind of nice. You get to look. Every table, I go, friend, 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 friend. It's just incredible the benefit you get that comes back to you and you put that on top of the service and the good that Rotary does all the way from local to international, what could be any better? So I think it's just an incredible uh, organization. I encourage you to uh, share it with your friends 
And Margaret, I have something for uh, Paul Harris Fellowship and for the scholarship cups. So, Terrific. thank you. You do, of all, of course, all understand you have to pay for getting older. Right, well, thank you very much, Phil. And you mentioned um, Africa. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we have two people here today who are going to help this club submit a grant so that we can do some work in Africa. Oh, really? Yeah, in Kenya, most specifically. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, well, birthdays are done. Thank you very much. Okay, Mitch, introduction of new member. Thank you. Carol. Yo. Is, uh, we have so many uh, prospective members here today, which is wonderful. You get an idea of the kind of winners want to be with winners. We're really thrilled that you're here. Um, so a lot of people have said, you know, we want to keep bringing in electrifying, powerful, oh, energetic yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. yeah come on, boys. All right. So uh, Daryl's retired from the electric utility industry after 40 years. He currently serves on the board of directors of Trico Electrical Electric Cooperative. He was a lineman. Now, some people may remember Glenn Campbell's song, Wichita Lineman. This was the inspiration for it. Uh, he was also senior management at most jobs uh, over in seven states. He's most proud of the 82 students in lineman work, which is a very dangerous profession during five years. He also was very involved uh, it's a director of operations during, you may remember, Hurricane Irma. He oversaw 200 linemen and none of them got hurt. So that was excellent. Very well done. He was honored at, to receive the Rotarian of the Year for the Marathon Florida Club in the Keys from 2016 and 2017. So you're going to be the first person to eventually be Rotarian of the Year in two clubs. We're looking forward to you doing that. <laughs> He enjoys hiking, obstacle course racing, volunteering at endurance races, and have completed a 24-hour, that's 24 hours in a row, 24-hour obstacle course. Um, and he hopes to continue doing it. He owns a sailboat in Alaska and Mexico, uh, and he wants to eventually circumnavigate the, uh, the globe. Hasn't done it yet, but he will. Uh, he's been married for 44 years, and his wife says, why does she do it? Well, she wasn't sure. But it's never been, uh, never been dull. I know you're trying to figure out if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, one last thing, just uh, in case you know, he had uh, DNA testing, and he found out, much to his surprise, because he was never told this, he's 100% Irish. Uh, he didn't know that, uh, but he had a clue because he's always loved potatoes in every form, including vodka. And now we can't decide between whiskey and beer. We have a whiskey club, so the answer is whiskey. Okay, uh, and he's made it his life's quest to decide which he likes better. Everybody, Daryl. He's Irish and I'm Scottish. What can you say? Meet you outside, boxing gloves. Dan. Sergeant at arms. We have the raffle today. The raffle's over a thousand dollars. There's 34 cards left. I've shuffled the deck in, in the interest of time. I'm going to ask Diana to pick the uh, the ticket. Come on, Diana, get the right one. You can't blame me if you don't win. It's Diana's fault. Okay. <laughs> All right. One seven 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 five eight. Mark Yay, Irvin. Good one, Mark. All right. And I have a bonus. Let's see if we uh, pick the card. Pick a card. See if he wins or doesn't win. Ooh, the king, but not the right king. <laughs> Next week. We always knew that you were a king, Mark, so. Oh, John, you're marvelous. Anything more from you, Dan, or not? No? It's in a minute. Okay. All right. Me. All right. I just want to let you know that we've had questions about our buffet and how if it does or doesn't intrude on fellowship. But I have a very simple answer for that. And, and that is get here early 
and you've got lots of time for fellowship and buffet. So, you know, think simple. That's me. Um, <laughs> we've done the raffle. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get here early. Okay, the next thing is a conference of clubs. <laughs> Sorry, my accent nearly came through. The conference of clubs. Um, the Casino del Sol, October. Please remember to register. These are fantastic events. You, you, a lot of us will be there. A lot of other uh, Rotarians will be there as well. So please do, um, do make sure that you get down there. Great speakers, great food, great company. Next, uh, I don't think Nina's here, but on behalf of Nina, uh, she made a plea last time for all people who are good technologically. She needs help in redesigning websites and such like Facebook, I don't know, TikTok, who knows. But anyway, please, 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 those people that are good at technology, please let myself, let Darina or let Nina know. Um, she really would appreciate some help. So thank you very much um, for, for offering in advance of you doing so. Alan Rogers, are you here? Uh, I'm stepping in for Alan today. Will you do that? Yeah, it's, uh, Brother John's the replacement social mixer next Wednesday uh, at uh, Stone Avenue, 5.30, 7.30. Sign up, please, as soon as possible so we get an accurate head count. There's always a good time. And I believe that uh, Brother John says, Whiskey Wednesday, in case you need to wet your beak. <laughs> Bruce Richardson. Uh, we have a all-day adventure coming up, hiking Mount Wrightson, Saturday, September the 2nd. Uh, anybody that wants to go, please let me know. We'll need RSVPs because of the logistics and more to follow. Thank you very much. And now the not Bruce Jacobs. Stepping in for Bruce Jacobs. <laughs> uh, Bruce, uh, by the way, had a grandchild this morning, so there you go. Yeah. So uh, on September 13th, the new Gem and Mineral Museum at 115 North Church. You buy tickets when you get there. They're $15. Meeting at the courthouse at 1130. Parking available underground parking facility. Lunch afterwards at Cafe a la carte. Uh, it's a wonderful experience. Bruce does a great job leading a tour. I highly recommend you go if you're available. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, this is on our, um, you know, the second Wednesday that we're not meeting for lunch. This is what we're doing. We're doing social or service projects. And this is the next social one. And although he did say $15, he forgot to mention that for <coughs> choke, choke, <coughs> choke, most of us seniors would be $10. I've been dying to go to this particular museum, so I'm looking forward to that. OK, terrific. OK, a car show. It's almost here. What? Huh? Huh? You cut me off. It's almost here. What? The Rotary Club of Tucson, 17th Annual Tucson Classics Car Show. Oh, I love that event. So much fun for the whole family. Yep, just 10 bucks gets you in the show and gives you a chance to win a spectacular 2016 C7 Corvette convertible, or you could win $40,000 cash or six other great prizes. Plus, the ticket gets you in the show on Saturday, October 21st from 10 to 4 at the Gregory School, where you'll see over 400 of the best classic and unique cars, super sport, hot rods to muscle cars, plus a very rare car worth over a million dollars. Come enjoy music, food, exhibits, and more. Just go to TucsonClassicsCarShow.com. Buy a ticket for your chance to win. The Tucson Classics Car Show, presented by the Rotary Club of Tucson, Saturday, October 21st from 10 to 4 at the Gregory School on Craycroft. Sponsored by WeBuyHouses.com and this station to support local charities. See, See you there! there. That's going to be on various uh, radio sh um, stations, and thanks to Mary Martin for coordinating all of that. It's the 17th Annual Tucson Classics Car Show, presented by the Rotary Club of Tucson. Just 10 bucks could win a spectacular 2016 C7 Corvette convertible Z51 or $40,000 in cash or six other great prizes. The raffle ticket also gets you into the car show on October 21st at the Gregory School. Proceeds benefit Pima Community College Foundation, Old Pueblo Community Services, and Big Brothers Big Sisters. See you there. Indeed, we will see you there. And now, Jeannie, see to for an update on the car show. Oh, those are exciting to see. Very, very exciting to see. And so, when you are happening to watch, 
So you watch them and you listen to them and you start talking to your friends about your involvement with the Tucson Classics Car Show. It's the perfect segue into go to the website, buy tickets, or you might be having some tickets on you. You could sell them. We are moving up a little bit. We've gone up about another percent since last week, but we've got 85% to go toward our goal of selling car show tickets. And I know you're all doing your part out there. We're collecting money in the back today. We'll be back again in two weeks. And in the meantime, during that two-week period, you can drop off envelopes in the office and we'll get them when we are back again the following time if you can't make it to that meeting. I would like to highlight um, the people in red are the people who've been newly added to those members who've sold 40 to 99. It's John Duvall, Wayne Meyer, Tim Puttenany, and Jeff Ronstead. And on the next page, we've also gained Joni Condit, who she um, bought online last week during the meeting. And um, I do want to just mention that there was a slight glitch with the online sales last week. If you hear of anybody that does not get an email confirmation, please let me know. Um, the system is set up to send them one. And there were f about 15 people that did not get one last week, but we we're taking care of that. And it's been repaired. And you'll get uh, to find out about it on the ticket credit report as people are getting credited for sales. And I do want to mention, Cindy, where we put a brand new Facebook post out on the Tucson Classics Car Show Facebook page, which is so makes it so much easier when you want to promote it to people. You can go to that Facebook post already and share it or comment on it um, and do various things to spread the word that people get out and buy. Lot, lots of publicity. It should help our sales. Thank you. Thanks, Jeannie. And for the guests among us, oh, yes, cheers, 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 cheers. For the guests among us who don't know, the car show allows us to generate about $200,000-ish, give or take, per year to give to local nonprofits. So, yeah, I know, I just heard it. Mm, right, yeah, I mean, it's a, a, a brilliant thing, great place to go, and the money that we, we receive does go to very, very, very good, um, uh, good, what, good, good companies? Good causes. Good causes. You do all understand, don't you, that when you're on a dais in front of people, you lose 10 IQ points. <laughs> all right, that's a given. Um, however, that's the end of the show. Um, it's now time to thank all of you for coming and to thank the virtual guests. Thank you so very, very much. I hope that every one of you enjoyed the meeting and those that are guests would consider joining us for more fun and frivolity in the future weeks coming. So um, on, on the tables you find blue cups, so please feel free to donate in those cups and the money goes to scholarships. And we are looking at, at alternative, updated technological ways for people to donate monies. So. Thank you all very, very much. Happy birthday to Hugh and to Phil. I must say thank you again to Sandra for giving these lovely people yeah. that dessert. <laughs> Yay. <Yeah. laughs> Congratulations and welcome to Daryl. And next week, remember, we're not meeting here. We've got the uh, Brother John's social mixer in the evening. I hope to see you all there. And I believe that Chris... Oh, by the way, by the way, every one of you, you've got to look at Chris's shoes. Stand here in the middle, Chris. I mean, I was looking at them when he was up here, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah, they don't fit, and I can't walk in them, but you know what? They look damn good. <laughs> well, I just want to, uh, I get to do the, the cheers, right? The toast. The toast. Okay, I forgot. See, I'm not very good at this. But anyways, what? Ten, yeah, exactly. But I'm still pretty good at this sometimes. Oh, right, good. Okay. So as everybody knows, I am always wonderful as usual, and it's easier for that because, you know, just you tell yourself that. So I want to tell everybody today and hope that you all do today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, your entire life, be wonderful as usual like me. We're now adjourned. Thank you so much. Great meeting. Bye. Yes, great. Good job.